four years earlier. Ah. So now we go and see what Morgana's been up to all this time. It wasn't until I lost everything that I truly understood just how blessed I had been. How much my time with them had allayed my wounded spirits. And how hard they had worked to mold me into an ordinary girl. But that was all gone now. I may not have said as much, but I liked it there. I was quite fond of the tranquility. I didn't want to lose it. I wanted to be happy as much as anyone else. <sighs> I'd long lost track of how far I'd walked. My legs were stiff, my knees didn't want to bend anymore. It took all my effort to remain upright. And I was certain I would never get back up if I did fall down. I still couldn't wrap my mind around what had happened. It was all so sudden, all so horribly senseless. It was so mind-bogglingly horrendous. Part of me refused to believe it was anything more than a bad dream. And that was what kept me walking. Because if I did accept it as reality, I would lose what remained of my will to live. It was supposed to be a party. The girls got together to celebrate my birthday. Making food and treats that, while hardly extravagant, were still a significant improvement over what we usually had. Everyone was laughing. Part of me was irritated by the whole affair, as I had never been comfortable in such lively environments. They were celebrating me. My birthday. I should have been overjoyed. Maybe this was my punishment for being so unappreciative. As soon as I stepped out, the bandits raided the brothel. Had I stayed there but a few minutes longer, things likely would have turned out quite differently. Whether for better or worse, I couldn't begin to guess, but at the very least I probably wouldn't be here alone. I could have gone with them to the next life. <sighs> During the raid, a man grabbed me, and I lost consciousness almost immediately after. When I woke, I was in a foul-smelling carriage. People were packed into the carriage like livestock. There were dozens of them, every inch of usable space filled with a body. Looking out across the cramped space, I knew instinctively I was on my way to becoming a slave. Once I had been sold off as a saint, a highly valuable commodity. But this time around... I was cheap, expendable labor. I was filled with an overwhelming emptiness as the realization struck. Something resembling sorrow waved around in the void as well. But it wasn't sadness for my own predicaments. It broke my heart knowing I would never see them again. That everyone I had to thank for all those warm, peaceful days had either been killed or sold off time the swe sadness swelled to form tears in my eyes. My whole life I had managed to endure without crying. And the first time I did, I shed tears for someone else. The man sitting next to me asked, why are you crying? To which I answered, I'm sad because I didn't get the chance to show my gratitude to people very dear to me. But if that had been the end of our conversation, I wouldn't be here hobbling down this endless road alone. I wouldn't be covered in so much blood. Sometime after I had responded, the man suddenly stood up and murdered the guards and slave traders. At first the other slaves thought they were saved, and for a moment I believed so too. He was a very curious looking man, his eyes smaller and narrower than ours, his nose a different shape. I'd never seen anyone who looked like him before. 
Is this the same guy that... Oh my gosh. All I knew was that he wasn't from around here. The man wielding a sword stolen from a guard searched through the slave trader's clothes for the keys to our shackles, which he gave to me and made me free his hands before proceeding to kill the slaves. I stood aghast as the massacre unfolded before me. Blood pooled at my feet. Severed limbs were strewn about the carriage. Bodies piled up haphazardly, many having only had enough time for their eyes to go wide in shock before being cut down. Men, women, children, everyone equals at the end of his blade. The strange looking man laughed as he slaughtered the slaves. He laughed and he laughed like he was having the time of his life. But when he was done, he stepped out of the carriage and wandered off, leaving me alone, the sole survivor. I had witnessed so much death in so short a time. Cruel, meaningless violence. Its victims powerless to resist. And here I stood among the bodies, left alive. For some inexplicable reason, left alive. The screams and despair, the pleas, the death, the laughter, all reverberating inside my head. <sighs> Oh, Father who art in heaven, please give me your mercy. I cannot take it any more. I pray, free me from this pain. My spirit was about at its breaking point. I was certain that I too would sink into the bottomless abyss if I kept all these emotions inside me much longer. I walked and walked and walked, no food, no water, my exhaustion at its peak, my mind in a complete haze, when off in the distance, I caught sight of a lake. So thirsty. Water. I began hobbling in the general direction of the lake, not caring that it took me off the main road. Bandits could have assailed me, wild animals made me their prey. None of that mattered to me anymore. At least then I wouldn't have to walk anymore. But for better or worse, I made it to the lake unmolested. The water was clear as crystal and seemed to sparkle like one as well. As soon as it was within reach, I dropped to my knees and drank, my thirst seemingly insatiable. The blood covering me had drifted several, dried several days earlier, but its bitter stench lingered. So after a brief glance around my surroundings, I washed myself. The chill of the midwinter lake and the occasional gust of wind pierced me to my very bones. No one their their right mind would bathe in weather, this weather. But common sense and chattering of my teeth didn't stop me. I wanted only to be clean again, and the frigid water felt like it would strip everything away, leaving my body and spirit new and unsullied. Once I was satisfied, I came to the belated realization that a small cottage sat on the lakeside. There's smoke coming from the chimney. Maybe there's someone inside. It could... It could be someone bad, though. Maybe it would be safer to stay away. But who knows when I may find someone else. Excuse me? Is anyone there? Hello? The door is unlocked. It was so warm inside. The heat from the fire seeped into my chilled flesh, spreading slowly. I almost burst into tears again. Sitting before the fireplace was an old woman. Cauldron hug ab hung above the flames, bubbling with a curious colored liquid. Ma'am? The woman merely sat there, her head drooped. Slowly I approached her, half certain of what I would find, and placed my hand on her shoulder. She was dead. 
and I hardly so much as batted an eye at the sight of yet another corpse. In fact, she looked like she had passed quite peacefully by comparison. How pleasant she was. There was no sign bandits had been rooting through the cottage. For some she had fallen asleep and passed away naturally while in the middle of concocting something. Looking around the room, I found myself surrounded by countless items I couldn't begin to identify. Plants of all colors hanging from the ceiling to dry. Berries crushed and stored in small glass bottles. Were I had to guess, the old woman made her living off herbal medicines. Having gotten a good look around the room, I thought that perhaps I had been guided here. And if my father had led me to this place, he would not frown upon me doing upon me for doing what was necessary to make use of it. So I dragged the old woman's corpse from the cottage and pushed it into the lake. If it didn't take up residence in the cottage, someone else eventually would. Or it would just be left to deteriorate. And I would rather take the opportunity bestowed upon me to have a place to rest my weary soul. As the woman's body sank into the clear lake, realization struck me. I hadn't crossed myself. A few days after I moved into the cottage, a man came to the door. Apparently he had been a customer of the woman's, a witch by trade, and he was looking for more medicine. When I spoke to him through the door, he gave a short gasp and, uh, and said, Who are you? West witch? Ah. Uh, I am her granddaughter. She's not presently home. Huh. Never knew the old lady had kids. So when's she gonna be back? Not, um, not for some time. Well, damn. Feel much better, herbs girl? What? As long as I can get my medicine, I don't really care who supplies it. You, her, doesn't matter. I'll still pay. One moment, please. My knowledge of herbology was essentially non-existent, but if there was a possibility I could make a living off of it, there's no reason for me not to try. I asked the man to give me as much information about the herbs he had been receiving, color, texture, smell, anything, and rummaged about until I found something that fit the description. The entire exchange occurred through the barely cracked door. The fan paid me as promised, but I quickly realized that money wasn't of much use to me, as I had no intention of returning to the city. So I told him that in the future I would trade for supplies, which he happily agreed to. A few days later, another man called upon the cottage, but unlike the first man, he sounded crude and uncivilized. I didn't want to cut off a potential source of supplies, though, so I handed him the medicine he requested. But when I did, he let out a low snicker and said, What did you say? I look after you, girly. He then shoved his hand through the crack in the door and grabbed my wrist. You ain't fooling me. I understand, it's just you, mate. Little girl, you need something to look after. Make sure no bad men threaten you. Every word that came from his mouth oozed with sleaze. I knew what would happen if he got the door open. Let's go! Whoa. I hiked my arm back with all my strength, slammed the door shut, and set the bar. But even that wasn't enough to quell my uneasiness, so I put a chair against it as well. Zven pounded on the door, each slam of his fist causing the whole room to vibrate. I've racked my chair, girly. Come on, open up. Still, I paid you, yet. Got something real nice to. Open up, I should have it. Uh, I don't need your payments. I am never doing business with you again, so please get off my property. Well, I say that I can. You got a lot of merit, nerd, eh, hey, little pish? Open the damn door, you don't want to know what'll happen if you don't. <sighs> You got more for sale than this bag's leaves, don't you? Open the heffin' door! Just stay quiet, Morgana. The best way to handle people like him is to just not respond. Good for nothing, you. 
Her day alerted her last summer. This world eat a little girl like you right off. <sighs> After giving the door one final parting kick, the man stormed off, loudly grumbling about how stupid and ungrateful I was all the while. I didn't deserve a word of his cursing, but at the same time I couldn't bring myself to be upset about it. He was right. The world would not be kind to a young girl living on her own. Not so long as men like him roamed free. I paced before the fireplace, my mind racing. I can't be sure I'm safe anywhere. Not even here. But going back to the city isn't an option. Not while the Lord lives to keep throwing his bloody sabbats. Everyone who might have protected me is gone. I have to make it on my own now. I have to be very careful about opening the door. I could be attacked again. Or worse. I mean, most men would probably run as soon as they saw my face. But most doesn't mean all. There's some out there who will go after anyone. I can't set my guard down while I'm doing business. Not even for a second. Man or woman, everyone is a potential threat. I'll make it on my own. I don't need anyone else. Me and only me. Being out here has really shown me just how sheltered I was at the brothel. How kind everyone was. How peaceful my life was. I just want to go back. No, stop it, Morgana. You're stronger than that. I put enough wood on the fire for it to last the whole night. Then curled up into a ball and slept beside it. For the first time in my life, solitude frightened me. Morgana? Mm -mm. What are you planning? To sleep all day? Come on, you're not Jaren. Huh? About time. Good morning. But little of it remains, anyway. What's with that look? Still waking up? What? What, what are you doing here? Excuse me? Why would I not be here? That, that doesn't answer my question. How did you even... A little bird told me where to find you. So you... You survived? Do I look dead to you? No, but... Still you. I thought you were killed during the raid. I may not be as good at, with a sword as someone, but you know I'm no pushover. I was going to let a bunch of bandits get the best of me. What, were you worried? Seriously, and here I thought all you knew how to do was damn me to the fires of hell. Was I... was I worried? Of course I was, you oblivious dolt! I never actually meant it when I said you should be cast into hell. Of course I want to see you alive. Of course, it would hurt me to lose you. I'm sorry, that was callous of me. I, I was afraid I would never see you again. I thought I had lost everything, everyone. I, I was scared to death. Whoa, 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 no need to cry. You're tougher than that. I'm not crying. If you say so. What do you mean I'm tougher than that? What do you think I am, made of stone? First you tried to pretend I'm a normal girl, and now you act like I'm some kind of heartless creature. Make up your mind already. I'm sorry, really. You're a perfectly ordinary girl, Morgana. Can you say that, looking at my face? I'm looking at it right now. Even though I'm a mean-spirited, bitter little girl. Even though you're a mean-spirited, bitter little girl. Though it's nice you acknowledge it. Oh. Burn in hell. 
<laughs> Say, I want to ask you something. And I want you to not call me weak for it this time. Let's hear it. Will you stay with me? I don't want to be alone anymore. It terrifies me. Yeah, absolutely. I'll stay right here, forever. You know you'll be able to accomplish your dreams out here, right? And you're fine with that? You bet. You told me to stay, and stay I will. We live right on a lake, and there's some mountains nearby. All things considered, it's not a bad location. We can plant some crops, go fishing in the lake, sprout on the grass under the starry sky. Sounds like a pretty good life to me. Maybe sometimes you can sing a little song. And I'll sit there, listening quietly. Or if you want some accompaniment, I can procure some instruments. That sound as nice as you do. As you, nice, that sound as nice to you as it does to me. Nothing, seriously. What else could you want? Hmm, how about... No, no, no. That's more than enough. <laughs> yes, if I could have a life like that, it will fade every misfortune in my life worth suffering. <sighs> He's not here. A dream. What else could it have been? He's dead, just like everyone else. They all died in the raid. And even if he was alive, he wouldn't come looking for me. What a childish dream. <sighs> Fight it, Morgana. You cannot cry over a simple dream. You are the daughter of God. Your tears are only to be shed. For others, not yourself. <laughs> I pounded my fist against the floor again and again and again, sobbing like a petulant child. I had never cried like this before. Not as I witnessed men, women, and children being slaughtered. Not when I was taken from my home. I didn't read the last line for some reason. Oh well. It wasn't until I realized just how much I needed that warmth. And that I would never have it again. That my spirit hit rock bottom. Finding and then losing happiness hurt worse than anything else. I wish... I wish I had never known happiness. I wish no one had ever shown me kindness. Not if it means I have to go through this. I wish I had never known what it was like to be normal. I could have just... I could have just stayed the daughter of God my whole life. Then I wouldn't be... Then I wouldn't be feeling like this. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew crying like that. It was so exhausting. But I never want to experience it again. I want to go back to who I used to be. A saint. If I didn't know happiness, I wouldn't have to feel like this. I just... I just have to forget it all. That part of my life, it never happens. No peace, no rest, only trials from my father. This is all I have ever known. <laughs> it's not hard. Just don't think about those years. Then you won't have to cry like this ever again. It's for the best. It's my only choice. 
See? I was always right. I never was. I never will be normal. But when the only one who offered me salvation, a god, one of his angels. And so I did precisely that. I led a solitary life. I did all my business hidden behind the cottage door. And I sent away anyone who wasn't here for medicine. Once a mounted man in armor rode up to the cottage. It looked like a knight, but I had no interest in getting involved with anyone who went around carrying weapons. I was responsible for my own safety, so I had to be careful about who I opened my door to. I had to be extra careful about who I dealt with. I didn't feel sad or lonely about it. By making that might normal, there was nothing to lament. Which my old memories served no purpose but to cause me pain. So I endeavored to push them far, far away into the depths of my mind. I couldn't simply discard my memories of what the Lord had done to me, of course, or of all the wonderful people I had met at the brothel. But as time trekked on, they faded into almost nothing. I couldn't describe what any one person's voice sounded like, how they acted around me, what kind of person they were, the things we did together, what they looked like, what their name was, anything of importance. I knew good and well it was callous to forget about all the people who had shown me so much kindness and warmth. But I would never see them again, and thinking about them only brought me pain. So there was no point in remembering. It was all I could do to make it by. Nearly four years had passed since I assumed the role of Lakeside Witch. My 16th birthday was approaching, but my age was perhaps the only thing I had in common with an ordinary teenage girl. Although I had grown up like any other girl, Having spent my childhood as a saint before being held captive by the Lord and made to witness countless people's deaths, that would probably mean there was something deeply wrong with me. By that point, a terrible cynicism had taken root in my heart. I built high walls around myself, keeping my contact with the outside world as terse and pragmatic as possible. With each passing day, my voice grew more monotonous. My interactions following a well-rehearsed script. My customers didn't make any attempt to force their way into my shell either. I'd begun to suspect they might think me not a witch by trade, but that I had actually formed a pact with the devil and worked his dark magic. No one said as much, but I could sense what seemed to be fear in their voices when they came to me. On the other hand, I never had anyone else tried to force themselves into the cottage like the man four years earlier, so I would say I had ra a rather peaceful life. If you could consider a life in which no one wanted anything to do with you peaceful, that is. I'd also come to learn a fair bit about herbology. I could now make my own medicines rather than just making do with what was already here when I moved in. Although a fair bit still amounted to almost nothing when compared to what my predecessor was capable of. Nonetheless, I had a relatively solid grasp on what herbs to use to treat different symptoms. Enough to formally assume the name of the Lakeside Witch, at least. And so time flowed on, uneventful and quiet. Until one day when a young man showed up at my door. Excuse me, is anyone home? I knew right away that he was a new customer. No one who had traded with me before bothered with such pleasantries anymore. I wanted the process to be quick and frictionless, and I preferred it that way as well. Who's there? When I responded from behind the door, he seemed to be taken aback. After several moments with no answer, I tensed up slightly and repeated the question. Ugh. My sister has fallen very ill and she desperately needs medicine. He has a very pretty voice. I was told that the person who lives here is a skilled herbalist. Could I please get something to treat her? 
What are her symptoms? Uh, um... She's got an extremely high fever that won't come down. She has no appetite, she's only drinking water, and she can't get out of bed. Everyone always seems to be looking for medicine for themselves. I haven't had a customer like him in some time now. We're going to watch to lower the fever first. After that, get her on a nutritious diet. I'm going to give you two medications. Give her the first while her fever is high, and the second after it's come down. Thank you very much. When was the last time someone thanked me? Here's your medicine. It's powdered, so it m so mix it with some water and have your sister drink it. Um, are you not going to open the door any wider? Is that necessary? N no, sorry. Just a second. Uh, let me get you your money. Ah. Uh, I take supplies for my services, not money. Oh, I didn't realize. I'm so sorry. This is all I have on me today. Would you maybe be willing to accept this as payment today? Very well. Is, is that a gold coin? Those herbs aren't worth nearly this much. Just who is this man? And what on earth is he doing here at a witch's cottage? In any other situation, I wouldn't have been even been tempted to look. What if he saw me? He would think me disgusting. Ridicule me like everyone else. It didn't hurt knowing what people thought of me. But it was hardly pleasant hearing it vocalized either. And what if he decided to do something in that moment so I dropped my guard? He could force the door open, have his way with me. He doesn't seem like that kind of man, though. Trust was about the farthest thing from my mind when interacting with people these days. I always remained on high alert, keeping a safe distance from everyone, no matter how good they appeared on the surface. But for some reason, I felt strangely comfortable in this young man's presence. At the time, I couldn't explain, couldn't have explained why. But in retrospect, I imagine it was largely a result of his upbringing. He spoke in a clear, well-enunciated voice. He had a polite, friendly air about him, which I could feel even through the door. It wasn't the sort of well-mannered you could fake with a bit of practice. Nor the sort you encountered out in the middle of nowhere. Curiosity took hold of me. I had to know what he looked like. I was going to throw the door open, of course, but I had no intention of inviting him in either. I just wanted to get a little peek at him through the cracks in the door, so I opened it ever so slightly wider than usual when re I reached out to take his payments. Uh. Uh, oh no, he saw me. Well, I didn't think you would be so young. I'd guessed you were a little older. Huh? Thank you for doing business with me. And I'm sorry for not coming properly prepared. If I need any more, I'll be sure to bring supplies next time. Uh, Alright. Again, I really appreciate it. Have a nice day. You too. He... He saw my face, and he wasn't disgusted. He actually smiled. I was so well caught off guard, I thought for a second that maybe my face had healed. So I ran over to the water basin, and a glimmer of hope in my heart gazed in, at, at my reflection. But the face looking back at me was the same as always. A grotesque, unsightly, patchy mess. Part of me was disappointed, but more than anything, I was flabbergasted by what had just happened. How could he smile at the sight of this face? For a swift second, my mind slipped back in time four years. The man who had applied to it to my face, he had never seemed to disturb by my appearance either. Not long afterward, the young man called upon my cottage again. 
He said that the medicine had briefly relieved his sister's symptoms, but that it had failed to actually cure what ailed her. Herbal medicine required patience and persistence before its effects manifested, I informed him, to which he responded with a sad smile. He was a handsome young man, not far from what I imagined from his voice, and the smile suited him quite well. There was a distinct elegance emanating from him. Ragged clothing aside, he was about how I envisioned a fairy tale prince might look. So I knew quite well those only existed in fiction. Real nobles were terrible, miserable, reprehensible people. After a few visits, we started having little conversations outside of our business transactions. He told me his name, Mel, as well as his sister's, Nelly. I told him mine. Mel was seventeen, only a year older than me. So one day, he invited me outside for a walk. So tells you to stay holed up inside all the time. You've got this beautiful lake right here. What do you say we take a little walk all around the shoreline?